Can black comedians be racist? A black person can't be racist by definition. Why is that? Because we don't have any control over people's lives. We can't. I can't tell you what neighborhood to live in. I can't tell you what school to go to. I can't tell you you're a second class citizen. I can't tell you that you can't vote. If I get on that corner and say, I, I get on that corner for five years and I stand there and I go, I'm going to take me a knife and I'm going to cut your throat and I'm going to take a car and I'm going to run you over and I'm going to take this hammer and I'm going to beat you till you dead. If I never kill anybody, am I a murderer? When I kill somebody, what does that make me? A murderer. Okay, what I talk about. I could talk about it all day long. All we do is talk. White folks do. White folks make laws. There's laws in the book. I'm from Louisiana. That said, if you marry out of your race, you go to jail. You understand? There's laws that you can't own property. They made laws. Laws. You can't vote. You can't go to school. You can't live in this area. Greetings, YouTube. Like the title says, white culture created the ghettos in America. Now, 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 before all you white knights start screaming white genocide, hear me out. In the post-World War II era, there was a lot of money floating around for mortgages. And a lot of it was, all of it was supported and backed by the federal government. Okay? Some was GI bills, but then there was also other federally backed mortgage programs out there billions of dollars. And all of that money went almost exclusively to white people. That in and of itself would have been bad enough. Okay? But it went a step further. The loans were not just going to white people, but they were going to white people that wanted to buy homes in good neighborhoods. You can figure out what good neighborhood means. It means no people of color and to a lesser extent no Jewish people. So what happened is that the people who owned the land who really wanted to sell to all those white people who had access to all that federally backed mortgage money made sure that their neighborhoods were good. So they moved out the people of color. So you ended up getting, you had a neighborhood here, neighborhood here, neighborhood here, which were all, all became exclusively white so all the people of color had to go somewhere, and that somewhere became known by us, the 20th century folks, as the ghettos, where all the people of color, particularly a lot of poor people, ended up being concentrated. And because our education system in America is based on property tax revenues, the percentage of the property taxes goes to our schools, the schools that were the, the the neighborhoods that were exclusively white had high property values. Remember, they were good neighborhoods, so they had ample tax dollars to fuel their schools. While the ghettos had low property tax values because it was not a good neighborhood, a good area, so they had very low levels of uh, property tax. So their schools were were incredibly underfunded. Go read Savage Inequalities for an example of that. It's heartbreaking. And because of that, you ended up with the next generation of poor people stuck in the ghettos at a disadvantage educationally and financially. While the children of the, of the good neighborhood white folks, they had a great education. And they had generational wealth because their families owned property. And that set the launch of the baby boomers to become incredibly well off. And of course, after, as soon as they became well off, they began to shut off all the avenues to success of their children are screwed. That's a different, that's a different topic. But the reality is, is that white people created the ghettos. They are a product of white culture. There's no way around this. There's no, there's no alternative facts or, 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 or some conspiracy theory. No, nope, no. Nope. White folks did it. We created the, the ghettos and then we blamed poor people for living in the ghettos 
being poor, having poor educations, and being unable to pass on generational wealth to their children. White culture created the problem, and then white culture blamed the people in the ghettos for the problem that the white culture folks created. It's a common tactic. And it's completely and utterly immoral. And there isn't any real simple solution to it. But the first stage we have to take, the first step, the baby step we have to take in trying to find a solution is for white culture to accept and admit the reality that they created the ghettos. That's the first step in any problem solving. Admit the problem exists and how it was created. And the ghettos were created by white culture. At the very same time that America refused to give the Negro any land, through an act of Congress, our government was giving away millions of acres of land in the West and the Midwest, which meant that it was willing to undergird its white peasants from Europe with an economic floor. But not only did they give the land, they built land-grant colleges with government money to teach them how to farm. Not only that, they provided county agents to further their expertise in farming. Not only that, they provided low interest rates in order that they could mechanize their farms. Not only that, today many of these people are receiving millions of dollars in federal subsidies not to farm, and they are the very people telling the black man that he ought to lift himself by his own bootstraps. And this is what we are faced with, and this is a reality. Now, when we come to Washington, in this campaign, we are coming to get our check. hundred years later, the Negro is still languished in the corners of American society and finds himself in exile in his own land. Self in exile in his own land. What happened is that the lenders uh, mortgage companies, other kinds of lenders on real, for real estate purposes would not lend past a certain geographical area or into a certain geographical area, namely uh, the black community. And when they did lend, they would charge a higher, and they still do, charge a higher, to a certain degree, a higher rate of interest with respect to that. And the realtors would steer individuals away from uh, the black community in particular, and some other communities, they call that redlining. It's a practice that is prohibited now, but it's done subtly in other ways still. I've had this, uh, this story almost a week now. Believe it or not, it was on NPR. And it's a story that's never told about the ghettos in America. So I want to tell you this story about ghettos in America. We hear the liberals talk all the time, right, about we have these segregated communities in the inner cities, and we don't use the word ghetto anymore, but ghetto is a perfectly legitimate word, and I will not be censured and told what words we can and cannot use that are, in fact, legitimate words. Believe it or not, this was on NPR. Historian says, don't sanitize how our government created ghettos. He means the modern inner city. Fifty years after the repeal of Jim Crow, many African Americans still live in segregated ghettos in the country's metropolitan areas. Richard Rothstein, a research associate at the Economic Policy Institute, and as far as I know this could be some left-wing Marxist group, doesn't really matter, has spent years studying the history of residential segregation in America, or it may be a conservative group, again I don't know. He says, we have a myth today that the ghettos in metropolitan areas around the country are what the Supreme Court calls de facto. Just the accident of the fact that people have not enough income to move into middle class neighborhoods. Or because real estate agents steered black and white families to different neighborhoods. Or because there was white flight, says Rothstein to NPR. 
It was not the unintended effort or effect of benign policies, he says. It was an explicit, racially purposeful policy that was pursued at all levels of government. And that's the reason we have these ghettos today, and we are reaping the fruits of those policies, unquote. So let's stop right here. His hypothesis, actually his assertion, based on his years and years of study, is that the government created the modern ghetto. Well, that caught my attention. Does it have your attention? Let's continue. One of the ways in which we forget our history is by sanitizing our language and pretending that these problems don't exist. We've always recognized that there were ghettos. A ghetto is, as he defines it, a neighborhood which is homogeneous and from which there are serious barriers to exit. That's the technical definition of a ghetto. Robert Weaver, the first African-American member of the cabinet appointed by President Johnson as his Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, described many of the policies that this fellow describes today in a book he published in 1948 called The Negro Ghetto. The Kerner Commission referred to the ghetto. This is a term that we no longer use because we're embarrassed to talk about it. And we need to confront our history, this is the professor, and stop sanitizing our language and talk openly about what we've done as a nation and what we need to do to undo it. And he goes on. He goes on and he says, it's a policy. Well, actually, let me do this. He says, and we can't talk openly if we're going to use euphemisms instead of being explicit about what the reality is. On how the New Deal's Public Works Administration led to the creation of segregated ghettos. Let me repeat this. On how the New Deal's Public Works Administration, the PWA, led to the creation of segregated ghettos, he says... Its policy was that public housing could be used only to house people of the same race as the neighborhood in which it was located. But in fact, most of the public housing that was built in the early years was built in integrated neighborhoods, which they raised and then built segregated public housing in those neighborhoods. So public housing created racial segregation where none existed before. That was one of the chief policies. Wow. And I thought we were supposed to celebrate FDR and the progressives in the New Deal. On the Federal Housing Administration's overtly racist policies in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, he says the second policy, which was probably even more effective in segregating metropolitan areas, was the Federal Housing Administration... You've heard of the FHA, right? Which financed mass production builders of subdivisions starting in the 30s and then going on into the 40s and 50s in which those mass production builders, places like Levittown, for example, Nassau County in New York and in every metropolitan area in the country, the FHA gave builders like Levitt concessionary loans through banks because they guaranteed loans at lower interest rates for banks and the developers could use to build these subdivisions on the condition that no homes in those subdivisions be sold to African Americans. Your ears should be ringing. This is New Deal progressive federal policy in the ghettos. Government policy, municipal policy, for example, denied adequate services, Garbage wasn't collected frequently. African Americans were crowded into neighborhoods in the ghetto because so much other housing was closed to them as a result. Housing prices in ghettos were much higher than similar housing in white areas. Rents were much higher than similar housing in white areas because you had a smaller supply. It's the basic laws of supply and demand. So this created slum conditions. So when African Americans managed to break out of those slums and buy a home in a neighboring area, whites could be persuaded that slum conditions were going to be brought into their neighborhoods. So the real estate agents at the time would go into these neighborhoods and try to panic white families into selling their homes cheap to the real estate agents. And they in turn would flip these homes to African Americans at a higher price. This was all started 
in the 30s under FDR and the New Deal. This was all started for the purpose of taking integrated inner city neighborhoods and creating segregation through federal spending and federal policies, federal bureaucracies, and federal departments. In his own land. Devastated America. The HOLC program was created in, in 1933 to help homeowners retain uh, force foreclosed homes. Approximately one million loans were made. Check this out, but not a single loan went to a black person. Check the history books. Check your um, your your your, um, your links. Google it. I did. Not a single loan, not a single loan went to a black person after the Great Depression. But whenever somebody, whoever, um, you know, these these persons who who claim that their ancestors came from overseas and their ancestors were treated just as horribly as the African slaves were. They try to tell you that they worked in sweatshops, no shoes on their feet. Many of them died in these sweatshops. Nigga, y'all had a job making money. Okay? We're talking about the 1930s. Where you were you were given a chance when you came over here. But when we came over here, you see what I'm saying? But, um, let's see. These were the these were the same people who received home owner loans. You want to talk about how bad you were treated yet you received a piece of the privilege. Uh let's see. The new deal um wait, I didn't finish. Uh, but not a single loan went to a black person, even though a greater portion of the blacks lost their homes in the Depression. The New Deal programs actually made home ownership more difficult for black Americans. It did. And this is why. I need you to listen. If you didn't listen to any other portion of this video, you need to listen to this part. Because this is the proof Concerning the HOLC, this is the proof of racial profiling towards blacks and privilege towards whites. It was the HOLC program that institutionalized the redlining. I'm going to start right there. Redlining. Pause this video. Go look up red. Google redlining. 
Google what it means. And I promise you it's going to say the exact same thing I'm about to say now. It was the HOLC program that institutionalized the redlining technique of racial profiling and discrimination against entire communities. It raided neighborhoods on the basis of risk and invariably assigned black neighborhoods to the lowest rating. So this is just like five-star restaurant, five-star hotel. The five-star hotel and the five-star restaurant would be equated to the, the gated communities. The one-star hotel and the one-star restaurant with all the roaches and shit and rats and shit in the kitchen, that would be equated to our neighborhoods. You see what I'm saying? Um, and I want to go back to this part where it says, um, I turned back too many pages. This part where it says it was rated, it rated neighborhoods on the basis of risk. What's up, everybody? My name is Rashid. Now, I'm going to do this brief video because I want to talk about a topic that everybody should know about by now. It's a topic that's affecting a lot of people across America. And that's gentrification. Now, I'm going to use this video to teach you the truth about gentrification. I'm going to teach you the truth that those who uh, support gentrification and those who defend gentrification do not teach you. Okay? You know, I'm going to teach you, you know, all the bullshit about, you know, gentrification. First of all, gentrification, like I said, is all bullshit. It's all bullshit. Because gentrification does not help or benefit poor blacks or poor Latinos or any other poor ethnic group. Okay? It does not benefit the communities of poor blacks, poor Latinos, or any other poor ethnic group. Okay? It does not help low-income neighborhoods. Gentrification helps the majority of white upper class and white middle class and maybe a small minority of blacks and latinos and other ethnic groups who've made it into middle class but they're just a minority the majority that gentrification benefits are those who are white middle class and white upper class okay those uh blacks and latinos who um Made it into middle class. That's a small minority. Okay. Now. You have those who. Um, <laughs> try to defend gentrification. By saying. That the reason why low income neighborhoods. Are being gentrified. Is because of. Um, the high crime rate. Because of the gangs. You know. The street gangs. You know. The murder rate. The burglaries. The robberies. You know. The laziness. All of that is complete bullshit. And what they don't do is they don't teach you how these neighborhoods became low income. They don't teach you where all those social problems come from. You know, people in these, these low income neighborhoods, they're not savages. You know what I'm saying? People are not born to act out like this. But you live in a society that created poor social economic conditions decades ago. Was created. This damn culture that you see out here now. Now, let's look at the history of inner city communities across America. Let's look at Brooklyn, the Bronx, you know what I'm saying? Chicago, LA, Detroit, you know what I'm saying? St. Louis. Let's look at all the major cities, right? Boston. Let's look at all the major cities. And let's look at before blacks or Latinos moved into those inner cities. You had poor Irish, Italians, and Jews who were in those inner cities, okay? Throughout the 1800s, okay, from, uh, 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 and throughout the early 1900s and mid-1900s, you had the Irish who had more gangs in New York than anybody in the history of New York, okay? The Plug Uglies, the Dead Rabbits, the Wyos, the Forty Thieves, okay, the Daybreak Boys, okay, the Westies, okay? 
The Irish had so many gangs out here in New York where they was killing and shooting and robbing and murdering each other. Okay, there's a movie called The Gangs of New York. Check that movie out. But then study the documentary of the real gangs of New York. Then comes in the Italians. Same order of business. Where I'm at, in Brooklyn, throughout Brooklyn, the South Brooklyn boys. Huh? The South, uh, the South Brooklyn Devils, the South Brooklyn Angels. Okay? The Ocean Hill Hooligans. Okay? Uh, uh, the Avenue U boys, the Avenue K boys. You understand what I'm trying to say? Um... Then you had uh, uh, the Jews, the same order of business when they came here, okay? The Monk Eastman gang in the Lower East Side fighting against an Italian gang called the Five Point Star Gang, okay? Out here in, 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 in Brooklyn, Brownsville, you had the Boys of Brownsville, which was a Jewish gang, okay? You had the Murder Inc., which was Murder Incorporated, which was a Jewish gang. A lot of people think Murder Inc. was a record label, but that was a real Jewish gang, you understand? So, you know, before blacks and Latinos moved into the inner cities, you always had poor Irish, Italians, and Jews here who were just killing, robbing, and murdering each other for decades before we even got here, okay? And the question is, why were they doing that? Because they, too, was discriminated against. Their communities, as a community, was discriminated against, okay? White Anglo-Saxons, okay, who ran this country did not see them as being uh, white. They saw them as being a bunch of European immigrants, peasants. Right? So they left their communities in, in, in chaos. Okay? But now, when blacks and Latinos started to move into the inner cities, okay, uh, you have, uh, you have uh, um, those whites that were there in the inner cities, they had the opportunity to move to the suburbs. Okay? Uh, FHA, which was a Federal Housing Administration, which was started by FDR, Franklin D. Roosevelt, who started that agency during the New Deal era. The New Deal era is the era that took a lot of poor white people out of the ghettos and poverty and pushed them into middle class status. Okay? So during the New Deal era, okay, you had a lot of poor Irish, Italians, and Jews and poor Anglo-Saxons who were pushed to the suburbs. They were taken out of the projects, okay, because the projects was built originally for poor and working class whites. It wasn't for originally for blacks and Latinos. It was mainly for poor working class whites who the project was built for. But when blacks and Latinos started to move into those neighborhoods, those inner city neighborhoods, like throughout Brooklyn, Detroit, Chicago, those whites, and, and also in L.A., those whites moved to the suburbs. The government, FHA, okay, Gave money to land developers, okay, throughout the um, 40s and 50s and 60s to build houses in the suburbs, okay, here in New York, in, in Long Island, in Staten Island, okay, and also in southern New Jersey, okay, and gave them affordable loans where they could purchase the houses and pay back in 30 years. What that did was take the whites out of the inner city communities, out of the ghettos, and allow them to create wealth for themselves, okay. Uh, uh, their schools were better invested into. They was building the FHA and all the other agencies during the New Deal era. Okay, when Franklin D. Roosevelt became president after the Great Depression. Okay, all those agencies started to uh, allow white communities to build wealth for themselves. Okay, uh, roads were built for them, parks renovated, schools renovated. Okay, um, you know, a lot of factory jobs were also uh, created within their community. And this is one of the reasons why so many blacks and Latinos started to move into the northern cities. Okay? Blacks and Latinos, like you had African Americans who was leaving the South. You had West Indians who was leaving the Caribbean. You had Puerto Ricans leaving Puerto Rico. Moving into the northern cities looking for those factory jobs that was left, that was created by the, the World War II and that was created by the automobile industry. But then when blacks and Latinos got into the inner city communities, and when, as whites are leaving out, it's called white flight. Those jobs that were there left with the white folks to the suburbs, creating high unemployment now amongst the inner city blacks and Latino population who continued to move into the inner cities. They couldn't go out to the suburbs with the whites, even if they could afford to. They couldn't move out there. They had to stay in the damn ghettos with no jobs now. All the factory jobs that were here went to the suburbs with the white folks. So the inner city started out with white people, poor, committing so much crime. But then when blacks and Latinos started moving in there, they was pushed out to the suburbs in nice houses, okay, that were cheap, maybe $7,000 for the whole house, okay. They can go to the banks and get these easy mortgage loans, pay back in 30 years for a $7,000 house. 
And what that did was create generational wealth for whites. As blacks and Latinos moved into the inner cities, our communities began to become what they call redlined. Okay, redlining is a term used to describe that if you was black and you live or Latino living in inner city communities, you cannot get a loan from a bank to buy a house or to start a business. Their excuse was, well, that's a risky neighborhood. But it's a risky neighborhood because you because the damn government made it a damn risky neighborhood by keeping the people in poverty. You understand? So now you can't get the money to, to own a house, own a business. The jobs are all gone. Here comes a high unemployment rate. Okay? The police in the community, who were mostly Italians and Irish, okay, who you were living in the community before, but they moved to the suburbs, but kept their police jobs in the inner cities, they did nothing but criminalize the people, okay? They didn't go after the real criminals, they just locked up everybody, they didn't give a damn. And this is another reason why gangs started, because white gangs will come to the black and Latino community, beat blacks and Latinos up, okay? So the blacks and Latinos had to create their own gangs, the fight against those racist gangs. Okay? So that's how the gang culture started. To protect the neighborhood. Because the police wasn't doing it. So the police is a big part in creating the gang problem in the community. But because they didn't do their job. So we had to create our own gangs. You understand? So. <clears throat> also, you know. There's poverty. There's no jobs. So here comes the drugs. And creating the, they could, you know, you're going to find a way to survive. You know? So these communities were pushed into poor social economic conditions. You know, through so many discriminatory practices, you know, uh, of redlining, you know, um, just so many, you know, contract selling, block busting, you know, you know, the way, uh, 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 you know, they were, uh, real estate agents will get a white person to sell their house for cheap and then sell it to a black person for three times that much, you know, you know, and then eventually the black person couldn't pay that, those loans back, you know, so they, they wound up losing the house anyway. You know, so it's just so many problems that they created here in the inner city communities that destroy these neighborhoods, man. You know, and and, 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 and and like I said, you know, the whites, they were here first, but then they left and went to the suburbs on government money. FHA pushed them to the suburbs with their money. And everything was made nice for them out there. And while blacks and Latinos were being pushed, it's called racial staring, because they racially stared us away from white neighborhoods and pushed us into the inner cities, the way they began to play their games, redlining the damn neighborhoods, you know. Police not protecting the community, you know, they allow the crime to run rapid, you know. You had people who did, well, you know, you had, you had some blacks who were allowed to buy houses or businesses, but it's a problem there. Because you, the police, you did nothing for the crime rate. So those people who were able to own houses and businesses within the inner city communities, property values were kept low. Because the police didn't keep the crime, the, the, the crime rate down, okay. The roads weren't prepared, sanitation didn't come and clean up the damn streets, you understand? And that brought the property value down within the communities. Okay? Now, you know, and, and that's how a lot of the problems within the inner city community started. You know? You know, had the people been, had the people received the same economic support that the poor whites received when they were there, the, pe the neighborhoods would have been better off. You know, the same police protection, the neighborhoods would have been better off. You know, health care, they didn't, we didn't see proper health care, you know, we would have been better off. But now that White folks are moving back. Now you start to see those resources being placed there. You see, the inner city communities would have never been low income had they not used discriminatory practices and policies to economically bring down those communities. But now that whites are moving back, here come the resources. Like I'm in, I'm from Brooklyn over here. Uh, you know, throughout uh, Bushwick, East New York, Bed Stuy, Crown Heights, Brownsville. You know, throughout, um, even in Harlem, Manhattan, in Spanish Harlem, you know, uh, 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 even um, West Harlem, you've seen cops all over the place in the past couple of years. I mean, two cops literally on every damn corner, keeping crime down. Where the fuck was those cops at in the 90s and the 80s? And, you know, where the hell were them cops at then, or the early 2000s? Where the hell were them cops then? So you brought the crime rate down, but not for the people who've been there for the longest. You brought it down so you could bring in white folks to come in. Okay? Because they're the majority that's moving in. Okay? So all the blacks and the Latinos who were going to school, going to work, trying to raise their children. Okay? Those who did own property. Or those who did was able to, to, to own property and houses, paying high property tax. Okay? You couldn't make the neighborhood safe for them. 
Okay, you couldn't keep the crime rate down for them. Okay, you couldn't um, clean up the streets for them. Okay, you couldn't put the bike lanes and the bus lanes and the cameras all over the place. You couldn't fix the parks up for them. Okay. Now, you know, back in the days, if you rode your bike on the sidewalk, you was getting locked up for that. Now we got bike lanes. And people still riding their bikes on the sidewalks, but they're not getting arrested. Why? Because you don't want to incriminate, you don't want to criminalize the new residents that's moving in who are white. You don't want to criminalize the young white people that's moving in because they all got bikes. Okay, and that's another uh, problem. The decriminalization of certain laws. Okay, when, it, when, when these inner city communities were just black and Latino, the police was here locking us up for every damn thing. Okay, you could ride your bike on the sidewalk, you could hop the turnstile, you could drink, if you know, if you were drinking alcohol in the public, you know, urinating in public, you know, get caught with a small bag of weed, you know, they locked you up for it. But now it's decriminalized. None of that stuff can can result in your arrest. Why? Because white people do the same damn thing and you don't want to criminalize them with that. She said, we got to understand what's going on, okay? Sum it all up, okay? Study how your, these inner city communities became ghettos through racist practices that were done throughout the 1900s, okay? Study the crime that was going on out here with poor white people, with Irish, Italians, and Jews, okay, and what was done to improve the quality of life in their communities, and then them being pushed out to the suburbs where everything was made safe and better for them, and then blacks and Latinos being pushed into the inner cities, okay, to where everything was just completely, we was neglected and ignored, okay, because, and, you know, people say, well, you got some blacks and Latinos who came from these neighborhoods who became doctors and lawyers, but that you're talking about individuals, we're talking about as a community, you have to Create better social economic conditions in communities in order for the masses of people, of the young people, that can become doctors and lawyers and you know and, and change their social economic status. You gotta change the damn social economic conditions in the community first. If not, if you leave it poor, you're only gonna get people that's gonna get up individually, not as a community. And some of them who are trying to study hard may get shot in the head. Why? Because the cops are not there to keep the damn crime down. Hmm? Oh, they're there now. You know, Lincoln Terrace Park used to be over here in Brooklyn used to be terrible, but now they fix it up and they, and they keep cops in the park overnight to keep the the the, the, the um park clean. And best thought, you got dog dog parks. And best thought is a damn dog park. Okay, so for years you allow you know people to destroy the parks. You know, so you didn't want to keep it clean for them. You didn't want to put sanitation in there to fix it up or keep the cops there to keep it clean, you know, to keep it safe. You didn't want to do that for, for the blacks and Latinos. But as soon as the majority of white people move in, you start fixing everything the fuck up for them. And they're going to come with a bullshit story because they know people don't know history. And we don't understand how our communities became in the uh, social, economic uh, 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 problems that they... We, that they were in, you know, we don't know how it got to be that way. So we become ignorant and blaming ourselves, thinking it's us who did this. No, that's bullshit. Our communities were pushed into poor social economic conditions, and they knew damn well from experience that the conditions or the symptoms that you see in these communities will always have been the result. See, they. The making of Newark's riot actually begins a full generation before the riots actually hit. You know, I think we often mistakenly believe that it's natural that the inner cities be problematic and the suburbs be pristine in the United States, but um, it wasn't really so much God or nature that decided that, it's human decisions. Mainly through federal housing, transportation policy, Newark was destined to become a city mainly of poor people, mainly of black people, where more and more upwardly mobile whites would be encouraged to actually leave the city. After World War II, and certainly throughout the 50s, the whole image of the suburbs was pushed. You haven't arrived until you get to the suburbs, until you have your backyard, until you have your front yard, maybe two cars. You know, suburban tracks were, were subsidized by the federal government, you know, and the highways were subsidized by the federal government. 1945 until really into the 70s, the suburbs were white territory, thanks to government action. It was not just white flight, 
It was also white people taking advantage who wouldn't of very uh, advantageous lending policies. These things had not been available before the war to a wide segment of Americans. They were not available to black people. You had the bank redlining under Roosevelt. Actually created maps where they literally drew red lines around a block with the presence of just one black person or one Jewish person would be enough to literally redline a block on the map, which meant there would be no mortgages given on those blocks. Newark is written off by the people who are uh, making these decisions. So they're really saying that Newark is not a good place for the federal government to invest. The suburbs are. Block busting, real estate developers have busted up blocks because you know one black family might move in, scare tactics to get whites to sell cheap and then sell high to the blacks who moved in. The pitch was, hey, you know, these colored people are moving in, you, you better sell now before your, your house value goes all the way down. And you get these people just to get scared, they'd sell their house slow. But then those blacks who moved in weren't getting any bank loans, they wouldn't get any insurance on those homes. So that led to conditions which deterioration of much of the wood stick housing that uh, Newark had. So it was, you know, <laughs> disgusting but fascinating from an economic point of view. When I grew up in the 50s, I can recall in my neighborhood, there were always places where people can get pretty decent jobs and establish yourself, have some kind of stability economically. Throughout the 50s, as many of these companies, they moved to southern New Jersey or southern United States until finally, you know, we're at the point where, uh, you know, companies just, global monopoly capitalism just will take it wherever, it, you know, they can make the most money. So, here you are a bunch of black folks up here looking for jobs in the industrial sector. Suddenly they got here and there was nothing here. It was like an old bait and switch route. All of those led to conditions that resulted in, you know, poor housing and poor health care and less job opportunities, which were why people felt disenfranchised, they were destabilized economically, and all of those things were what led to Newark in 67 or Detroit in 67 or, or Watts. Home ownership the means by which most Americans begin to generate familial wealth. Unbeknownst to most, there was this little big thing called redlining, which was engaged in by the U.S. government, local realtors, and lenders in determining who got to realize this so-called American dream. What's redlining, you ask? Picture a classroom full of students that are prepping for an exam that they must pass in order to get to the next grade. 85% of the students get to come into class every day, are given extra materials to go over, and can meet with the teachers to make sure they understand everything on the test. The remaining 15% get no assistance from the school whatsoever. By the time the test comes around, who do you think has the overwhelmingly better chance of getting to the next level? That, my friends, is how redlining works. In the 1930s, the Homeowners Loan Corporation, HOLC, joined together with local lenders and realtors and set out to evaluate the mortgage lending risk of 239 cities across the U.S. When the HOLC evaluated the city, they attached letter grades, A through D, to neighborhoods based on a myriad of factors, with race being the preeminent one. Black areas systemically scored poorly, white areas scored well. According to the U.S., they were solely looking to loan capital to areas that were considered strong in the potential of returning that investment. Yet, at the same time, they also claimed to be guarding against, and I quote, the infiltration of foreign-born, Negro, and lower-grade populations. For 20 years, between the 1930s and 50s, three-fifths of homes purchased were financed by the FHA. Realize, of that number, 2% of FHA loans went to non-white home buyers. Redlining was practiced in mass from the 1930s to the 1970s. Just to realize how ridiculous this situation was, go and research the Burwood Wall, a six-foot-high cement wall built in Eight Mile, Detroit, that split the black area from the white area. Once the developers created this wall, the U.S. government agreed to fund their project. If you take a look at the historic red line maps of cities across America, and then take a look at the neighborhoods within those cities, there's no question, the evaluators were visionaries, whether for good or for worse. To this day, those neighborhoods still represent the most poverty-stricken areas in all of America. We came to Levittown and we found the model house and we walked in and we looked around and uh, of course in the eyes of a uh, young man who was raised in the ghetto so to speak, 
It was an interesting experience, an interesting lifestyle, seeing all the new modern conveniences. Very fascinating. Eugene Burnett came home with almost a million other black GIs. They had fought for the country in segregated ranks. They returned hoping for equality and the American dream. For many, that dream was a new home for little money down and some of the easiest credit terms in history. I went up to the salesman, we're interested in your home, we're interested in buying one, and uh, what is the procedure? Is there an application to be filled out? So forth, so he looked at me, looked around, and he said to me, he says, listen, it's not me, but the owners of this development have not as yet decided to sell these homes to Negroes. It was as though it wasn't real. You can't imagine. But for someone to come out and actually tell you that they can't sell to you. You know, I, I was really on an up. Man, look at this house. Can you imagine having this? And then for them to tell me because of the color of my skin, I can't be a part of it. The FHA underwriters warned that the presence of even one or two non-white families could undermine real estate values in the new suburbs. These government guidelines were widely adopted by private industry. Race had long played a role in local real estate practices. Starting in the 1930s, government officials institutionalized a national appraisal system where race was as much a factor in real estate assessment as the condition of the property. Using this scheme, federal investigators evaluated 239 cities across the country for financial risk. So that those communities that were all white, suburban, and far away from minority areas, uh, they received the highest rating, and that was the color green. Those communities that were all minority or in the process of changing, they got the lowest rating and the color red. They were redlined. As a consequence, most of the mortgages went to suburbanizing America, and it suburbanized it racially. The racial logic adopts the principle that an integrated neighborhood is a bad risk, is a financial risk, that an integrated neighborhood is likely to be an unstable neighborhood, uh, unstable socially, but therefore also unstable economically. When the white residents of Eight Mile Road in Detroit were told they were too close to a black neighborhood to qualify for a positive FHA rating, they built this six-foot wall between themselves and their black neighbors. Once the wall went up, mortgages on the white properties were approved. Between 1934 and 1962, the federal government underwrote $120 billion in new housing. Less than 2% went to non-whites. I can understand an individual, depending on his environment or his family or whatever, uh, being racist, but for your country to um, sanction it, give him tools to do that. There's something deadly wrong there. The metropolitan Detroit area has been one of the most segregated regions in this country for many decades. It becomes more than clear as we go into different communities and different neighborhoods that we are not living with one another. Racial segregation in housing does impact all aspects of our lives. There's forces within society that are not comfortable with equality, despite the fact that the Declaration of Independence is the value that the world looks to America for. 
Theoretically, I think the American dream is there, uh, but I think if we have the willingness to look behind it, we will see that we're making achieving the American dream predictably more difficult for some people than others. When you're starting out of the gate well after the race has started, then no matter how hard you try to catch up, you're at a deficit. City of Detroit is one of the poorest places in America. Half of the children in the city of Detroit live below the poverty line. Now that is a profound level of inequality. So when we talk about a segregated community, we're talking about a community that's segregated from opportunity. We live in a country where your zip code is an identifying factor for um, the potential that you have to achieve and succeed. The whole idea of saying that I can go after the American dream, that all you have to do is just give me the opportunity. Well, how do you get the opportunity? In the late 1910s and the early 1920s, all of a sudden there started to come into Detroit a massive migration of African Americans. 1910, Detroit had a black population of 5,700 people. By 1920, it had a black population of 40,000. And as that population rose, all of a sudden, whites started to say, we don't want African Americans living next door to us. Now this is not a hard thing to explain. This is a rising tide of racism. So it wasn't controversial. In fact, it wasn't even considered, for the most part, racist. To believe that whites were better than blacks was just a fact. The Great Migration really helped grow this city when people came from the South to the North because of Ford's $5 a day wages that everybody felt they could now be a part of that American dream. They heard that Detroit was the promised land. Housing then became a premium, and so people uh, doubled up, uh, people slept in cars. Up until that time, when you wanted to get a mortgage, the bank would give you a short-term balloon loan, which would have to be paid off in five years and would probably be for only 50%. So when the FHA comes along and says, we'll loan people 95% of the money, guarantee it to the bank, and give you 30 years to pay it back, that is a tremendous resource. That changes everything. Where it made home ownership available, but it was mainly for whites. And now that's sometimes shocking to Americans, like, no, that couldn't be the case. But remember, this is the 1930s and 40s. Jim Crow laws were rampant in America. When the Federal Housing Administration was uh, formed in 1934, their underwriting manual, which was their policy guide, indicated very clearly that our neighborhoods are to stay homogenous, meaning that um, white neighborhoods stayed white, black neighborhoods stayed black. What the FHA did at the time was took a red marker and marked areas that they were willing to insure a mortgage loan. And this became known as redlining. And the government helped create maps and helped banks create a appraisal system. It encouraged banks and other lenders to not loan monies where blacks were present or where blacks and whites were present together. So here you have the real estate industry and the federal government working hand in hand to create uh, the ghetto. The real estate industry worked to write racially restrictive covenants that said that the real estate, the home, the land could only be sold to a white family if it was occupied by a white family. The home that my aunt and uncle live in um, had in their deed is indicated that no Negro shall live in that house. So the key to the segregation of Detroit in the same way is the key to the segregation of Chicago and New York and Philadelphia and Cleveland and Boston is that the forces of the real estate marketplace took that rising tide of racism and they institutionalized it. My brother and I, he's younger than me, Billy, and some of our friends, we looked for places to play. And I was 10 years old, he'd been eight. And then one day we said, let's go over here eight mile road, west of Wyoming in this wooded area. And we um, come to this wall. We thought, man, what in the world is this? It had a very ominous, eerie feeling to it. Here in Detroit, uh, there was a developer that wanted to build a development for whites. And they wanted to get FHA loans. And the, the federal government said, you know what, there's a black community kind of close by. You don't get the good loans. Uh, and so the developer 
in an effort to try to fix that, built a six foot tall wall, a, a foot deep, to separate the black community from the emerging white community. And then the federal government gave the loan. So on one side of the wall, you continue to have these rural, uh, underfunded, poorly maintained homes with people who didn't have much resources, while on the other side of the wall you have people who are moving into freshly painted homes with driveways and streets and new sewers. Folks who went in and, and, and signed on the dotted line and got those 30-year mortgages and looked at themselves with self-satisfaction and said, we just pulled ourselves up by the bootstraps, were in fact taking advantage of the FHA, providing them with resources and guaranteeing those funds. The whole faith and credit of the U.S. government was behind that. That makes a huge difference in a person's life, which side of that wall you end up on. But it's a symbolic wall, and uh, it, it's an insultingly low wall in a certain way. Uh, the belief that that's all it took to separate the races and to maintain that separation. It is a very, very stark and ugly symbol of race discrimination, racial feelings, but also the dividing of resources uh, within our communities. This wall was effective because it fit the pattern of people's minds. It fit the structures of how they thought public policy was supposed to be done. And it fit so well that no one even gave it a second thought. In 1941, again at the time that we're fighting Nazi Germany around his claim of uh, white purity and white supremacy. We had our own kind of white purity and white supremacy. That wall still exists today. Eventually, blacks were able to move on both sides of, of the wall, but the whites are not there. The whites were given another exit. The wall no longer was separating people in the physical way, and then the wall had to move in a sense. And so people began to use the county line as the next barrier of separation. When I think about Eight Mile, and while there's no wall per se, what that has meant for this region for decades around the divide between the city and the suburbs and how that uh, invisible wall feels so visible. The wall exists in many other communities and it exists not necessarily the way the Burwood Wall does, but in other communities the wall is a set of berms. There have been fences. There's often a railroad track. That's a common thing that we talk about. Which side of the tracks do you live on? I have seen Detroit go demographically from a city that, uh, as a young man, uh, we probably had about 20% African American to currently it is uh, probably closer to 85%. It's been, a, it's been hard to watch, uh, only because uh, you felt that the change uh, to, to a great extent resulted from people fleeing. As more African Americans moved in, the, the rate at which whites moved out was just um, very, very stark. And for the businesses to have followed the residents uh, means that um, opportunities that were there in the 1950s, 60s, maybe even 70s, they just uh, they don't exist anymore. And what has been left behind is a population that isn't just overwhelmingly black, but it's also overwhelmingly poor. If you're stuck in a place where there aren't city services, where healthcare isn't as good, where the educational system isn't as good, then you're locking people into a poverty that they might not otherwise be locked into. Space and race are uh, just as significant today as they were prior to the implementation of that physical wall. Why is there a different set of rules in different places? We don't have a transportation system, for example, here in Southeast Michigan that connects you to anything. You cannot get from downtown Detroit to the airport unless you have a car. And 40% of the residents of the city of Detroit don't have a car. So how do you connect those people to opportunities? The big question you gotta ask yourself is, so you create all this system, that's ancient history. It's all illegal, it's all been eliminated. So why do we still have segregation? Once you link together race and the marketplace, it's really, really hard to pull it apart. That's why you get white flight. That's why you get the maintenance of segregation. We can sort of see the 
sort of sins of the past and our mistakes of the past, it's harder to see what we're doing now. And what we're doing now is hiding in plain sight. Think about the recent housing crisis, the subprime loan that um, started really in the black and Latino community and then spread throughout the country. Those communities have been starved for credit, starved for insurance, starved for new development for 30, 40 years. As more credit came into the world, it was directed to those communities, but it was at a higher price. And 50% of those loans should have been market rate loans. They should not have been subprime loans, which made them less affordable. And so the whole credit system itself uh, has created a new wall. One response to this segregation is to respond through the legal system, the same system that, that supported it for so long. We have found through our investigations and, and work, mortgage companies, banks in particular, have been denying credit in a uniform way in the modern era today uh, to uh, qualified applicants. Every time this metaphorical wall is breached, the folks who have been taking advantage, the lion's share of those resources, find a new way to maintain that same system. This is Alexis of Intellectual Media, and this is Two Minute History. Let's talk about Chicago, redlining, and creating the black ghetto. Recently, there have been a lot of grumblings about Chicago. What's going on in Chicago? I said the other day, what the hell is going on? Particularly about the violence. But to understand the state of black Chicago neighborhoods, one must know the history of those neighborhoods. When black people fled from the South during the 20th century to Chicago, they often faced competition for jobs and housing from European immigrants. Through the 20s and 30s, many Chicago neighborhoods had covenants barring black people from moving in. Thanks to the 1934 Housing Act, residents in certain areas were denied loans, mortgages, and insurance. These areas were often lined in red on maps for banks, and were surprised, predominantly black. Black people were forced to contract buy or rent overpriced and overcrowded apartments, which made financial situations worse for people who were usually getting paid less than their white peers. In 1946, Chicago began producing projects in poor black neighborhoods to keep them out of sight and out of mind from white Chicagoans. When white people fled for the suburbs of Illinois, they left behind cities in crisis. There were fewer businesses, less jobs, and less incentives for government help. In black neighborhoods, schools suffered from low property taxes. Crime wasn't effectively regulated by police, but they did make sure to implement police brutality. Plus, less jobs meant more crimes for survival, usually via drugs or prostitution. If anyone wants to address crime and violence in modern day Chicago, I'm looking at you, Donald Trump. What the hell is going on? They need to address the systematic disadvantages that created these neighborhoods. They also need to address the generations of economic disadvantage. Matter of fact, if anybody wants to address generational violence and crime in cities across the country, they need to examine the patterns of racial discrimination and laws that allow it. Welcome to America. Because Chicago isn't the only city that redlines its black citizens into economic disadvantage. The ghetto or the hood or whatever you call it was not created on accident. As the United States was in the Great Depression, the government developed a number of programs under the New Deal Act, with one program being public housing, the building and constructing of housing projects under the creation of the Housing Act. To build these complexes in an attempt of slum clearance, many neighborhoods were demolished for the construction of housing projects, which mainly became the removal of African American communities. Years later, Urban renewal, the rebuilding of infrastructures and revitalizing cities' downtown areas, 
during the 1950s and 60s changed the outlook of communities as civic centers, interstates and highways, and other projects were placed directly in the heart of the African American community. This was during the time when there were many prominent and thriving African American neighborhoods as the United States was beginning to integrate and desegregate its communities. Urban renewal caused the African American population to expand and spread into other parts of town and to create newer neighborhoods, but none that were as thriving as their previous communities. Starting in the 1990s, gentrification began with the demolishing of housing projects and continued with the rebuilding of urban communities after knowingly allowing neighborhoods to deteriorate and become dilapidated in areas near cities' downtowns, business districts, and other local attractions. Similar to urban renewal, gentrification is relocating African Americans further from the inner city and into the outskirts and suburbs of their native city. When we think of gentrification, we normally think of massive displacement replaced by a creative class who work in the interest of building up the property value of the area rather than the oppressed residents. Why don't y'all take a look at that sign up there? See what it says? Cash for your home? You know what that is? It's Bill Bill Boy. What are y'all, Amos and Andy? Are you stepping and he's fetching? I'm talking about the message, what it stands for. It's called gentrification. It's what happens when the property value of a certain area is brought down. Huh? You listening? Yeah. To bring the property value down. They can buy the land at a lower price. Then they move all the people out, raise the property value, and sell it at a profit. Now, what we need to do is we need to keep everything in our neighborhood, everything black. Black owned with black money. Just like the Jews, the Italians, the Mexicans, and the Koreans do. Ain't nobody from outside bringing down the property value. It's these folk Aww. shooting each other and selling that crack rock and shit. Well, how you think the crack rock gets into the country? We don't own any planes. We don't own no ships. But we are not the people who are flying and floating that shit in here. I know every time you turn on the TV, that's what you see, black people oh, yeah. Yeah. selling the rock, right. pushing the rock, yeah. pushing the rock. Yeah, I know. But that wasn't a problem as long as it was here. It wasn't a problem until it was in Iowa and it showed up on Wall Street where there are hardly any black people. Now, if you want to talk about uh, guns, why is it that there's a gun shop on almost every corner in this community? Why? Tell you why. For the same reason that there's a liquor store on almost every corner in the black community. Why? They want us to kill ourselves. You go out to Beverly Hills, you don't see that shit. But they want us to kill ourselves. Yeah, the best way you can destroy a people, you take away their ability to reproduce themselves. Yeah. Who is it that's dying out here on these streets every night? Y'all. Yeah. Young brothers like yourselves. What am I supposed to do? Fool roll up, try to smoke me? I'm gonna shoot the motherfucker if he don't kill me first. You're doing exactly what they want you to do. You have to think, young brother, about your future. It's called gentrification. It's what happens when the property yeah. value of a certain area is brought down. Huh? You listening? To bring the property value down. They can buy the land at a lower price. Yeah. Then they can move all the people out, raise the property value, and sell it at a profit. I'm just a boy from the hood. I feel like furious styles. Gingerfication in our ghetto. This nation is ours. We built this shit. The worst thing about gentrification is that the people who live there aren't able to afford to live there anymore. Look, people can't live in Lower East Side. Everybody in Lower East Side, they moved to Williamsburg. The people, particularly the, the, the 
my Puerto Rican brothers and sisters, they can't afford Williamsburg anymore because of hipsters. They moved to Bushwick, pretty soon, Bushwick's gonna be like Williamsburg. After Coney Island, there's nowhere else. After the beach of Coney Island, it's the motherfucking Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> so either you're gonna move back, black people, a lot of black people doing, moving black down south, you get a house, a lawn, Puerto Ricans, Dominicans moving back to Puerto Rico and then Republic because people can't afford to live in New York City. And if we lose our black, Dominican, and Puerto Rican population, New York City, it's not gonna be New York City. It will not have the flavor. So whoever becomes mayor at the Bloomer Leagues, I think that we have to talk about affordable housing and, and get these public schools back. Because, you know, I'm blessed. I can send my children to public, the private school. I didn't go to private school. I went to private school. Public school from kindergarten all the way up to John Dewey High School in Coney Island. Public school was good then. When I went to public school, you had to take art, you had to take music, you had to take gin. All across this country, in public schools, kids are growing up today, no art, no art classes, no music classes, and no gym classes. And you know, and it's a shame. And then you wonder why people say, why, why is India and China and these other countries, you know, leap leaving past as far as when it goes to, you know, the education of our young people. What is that? Oh, they put something up there since then? I haven't seen any stores on that side yet. Oh, wow. Well, I remember when they were building it. Two cent candy. I have that, sir. What is it? That is two cent candy. <laughs> Literally, that's what it says. It's two cent candy. That's this here. The fruities and down there by your knees are the chews. And I have cherries and th those are, yes. Hey, Mr. Wise. Thank you, sir. 
The ones to your left are 199. The ripper is 99. I think I'll take one of these. I need some energy. All right. That gives me a beer tonight when I get up. <laughs> <laughs> you wait till the evening hours? Yeah. Good seeing right, you again today. Go. Thank you. I'll see you tomorrow. All right, sir. So I'll be here. Right. Yes, sir. Thank you. I appreciate it. Here, hello, my, my youngest daughter. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. How's my baby? Tell your sister before I do, and I'll tell her when I talk to her, hopefully today, if uh, she gets my call, that uh, we're moving next week. You know, I uh, haven't found a store location yet. I, I'm looking. I don't want to go too many months without a store. Just like that, learn how to be soft too. Everything is not always rigid. In and out. Hey, 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 hey. Do not anticipate my command. Hey, 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 hey. Oh, hop. Okay, stop. If someone was trying to hurt you in the streets, you're gonna say hey like that, like it doesn't really matter. Hit it hard and key out loud as well. Thank you. That's better. Get up here, sir, like you have a purpose in life. Yes. Thank you. I like that key eye. That was better. You could do a little bit better. Yes. Thank you. Put your eyes on it. That's called she son. Focus. Give me your money. Oh, hey. see? That's how it works. It's supposed to work just like that. You know what it is. See? Just like that. That's exactly how it works in the street. Uh-uh. Pop. Like that. The whole thing. Oh my goodness, that, that, no, that was it, okay. that was it. Very good, we hopper. All right, <laughs> you're great, no ma'am. Um, just want to inform you, uh, those who have not been privy to this information already, this is our last month at the school, our last month here. And it's part of that change uh, that I call it gentrification of downtown, them changing, you know, buying up buildings and properties, turning them to condominiums and stuff like that. I've been here over 10 years, and um, I don't have any control over it because I don't own this property. That doesn't mean that our, our training is going to stop, but since the school is here and the store is here, and I live here, I have to move all three of those items uh, in question. All right, that was it. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, him. You got the powers vested in me, sir. Uh, you have proven yourself to be a very loyal student with all of the chicanery and all this stuff. Chicanery. And, uh, and, the, and, the, and the great performance in the tournament this past week. Uh, I'm proud to say you are now third level. Oh, yay! <laughs> <laughs> all right, sir. Okay. You can cry, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys. <laughs> After nine win. Okay, well that's good. Hold on. Rain. You, Miranda, not Miranda. Amanda. <laughs> Daddy talking. 
Amanda said that after nine tomorrow, she can help you take some of the smaller stuff over there. Any of those small boxes, just, well, just you and her, any of them small boxes you can, in the, what is that I see? Don't get him wet, Larissa. I had a working relationship with the previous owner. About a month and a half ago, he walked in this door and he reached over, shook my hand and said, we've sold the property. You come home one day and you open the envelope up and it just says you have 45 days, we're sorry. You know, they started out that way, we're sorry uh, for the inconvenience and all this other stuff and that, that's it. They want something different. They want a certain look and they don't want a mom and pop store. They want to gut the building out and they've already started doing that and they have another plan and uh, we're not in that plan. Thank you, dear. Take care. Kiss mama for me. I will. This is your last day, though, No, tomorrow's the last day. Where are you living today? We're moving home to Northside. Northside? Yeah, I used to live there on Fergus 10 years ago. On Fergus? I know somebody used to live there. But the house has been torn down since we moved. And the lab for me. Can you get that lightweight? Yes. Okay. I mean, they're amazing shoes from Skechers. 
Why you call him Fat Man? Yeah. Oh, family oh okay, because he sure ain't fat. Yeah. Mm -mm. No, because it's, 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 we're being too risky. And that, that bag sitting on top need to sit down behind that mattress. How you doing? Sorry, Kung Fu. I'm all right, Kung Fu. <laughs> all right. Now, what's happening in all the It's called gentrification. It's what happens when the property yeah. value of a certain area is brought down. Huh? You listening? They bring the property value down. They can buy the land at a lower price. Yeah. Then they move all the people out, raise the property value, and sell it at a profit. I'm just a boy from the hood. I feel like furious styles. Gentrification in that ghetto. This nation is ours. We built this shit. Yeah, yeah, we built this shit. I'm just a boy from the hood. I feel like furious styles. Gentrification in that ghetto. This nation is ours. We built this shit. I get up, but we don't need no. Only use the curb for the liquor we pawn. Nigga got shot, now it's time to mourn. Is what it is, baby, like move on. Got a little struggle, cause it made me strong. Whole foods in the hood, now the rent got raised. But I'm still living off minimum wage. Nigga can't even afford to stay. Next thing you know, they gon' own the block. Shit too high for the mom and pop. Stoles we was raised on, on the block. Now we gotta make way for a coffee shop. Can't take shit, so they buy the land. Living next door to the fire man. And a couple with a dog, but they don't even speak. Walk around acting like they're better than me Cause they make six figures with a college degree I grew up around here, these ain't apartments to me Steady jacking up the price, but you got it for cheap Motherfuckers ain't fooling me I love my skin and I love my soul We was all slaves, was the lie they told We started out kings with diamonds and gold But they took our shit, baby, ain't that cold? I'm just a boy from the hood I feel like furious styles Gentrification in that ghetto This nation is ours We built this shit I'm just a boy from the hood. I feel like furious styles. Gentrification in that ghetto. This nation is ours. We built this shit. Yeah, yeah, we built this shit. Where we gon' live if it ain't the hood? Can't move up cause a nigga po. Still in the 
recession and the jaws is low Only other option is slang some blow Three strike rule, better think again Kicking us out and they moving in Pushing us all to the side of the city Full of liquor stores in the water, shitty School fucked up, down teach the kids About who they is or what we did Aliens and build them pyramids We the ones started the beauty supply People bought it out, now prices high Everything around me gentrified Better wake up, nigga, open your eyes Go and get high, then you eat pie pies But it ain't no town, only on our side Cross their finger, cause they hope we die Must have forgot we was born to survive Only in the hood when you need a vote Or fucking our women in exchange for dope Same old shit, it ain't changing though Got me feeling like God my only hope Leave him alone! Oh What you gonna do, Tom? Oh, 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 yeah! It's on now! Go get him, boss! You bitch is about to get it, man! <laughs> get him, bud! Come on! What the hell you say? Nigger. Fuck you. God damn it! Don't you ever talk back to me again! Uh, you tell him, Tom! Uh, with that boy! You give Shut the boy. fuck up, Jason! God damn it! Don't you sass me! I'm telling you, no Please. more sass! God damn you! Damn you! Uh, yeah, shut up! We can be more. We're so much greater than this. But you can't see? They're using us for their own gain, their money, their power. And what do we get? Huh? We can't let fear control our circumstance. If we stay here like we are, we'll die here. You can control this and this. Liberate your mind. You can see a whole new world. A world only you can control. Hey! No, we ain't ready. Ain't nobody ever ready. You just gotta do it. Get up, get up. You gotta see this dude. Your boy's getting his ass with <laughs> America is that you got a process in, in place right now in urban re in re redevelopment. They're using five techniques to totally wipe you out. One is called gentrification. They're going into all these major cities that used to be majority black population populated cities and they, they are erasing you in, in places like Detroit, Michigan, New York, Boston, Washington DC. Washington DC used to be the chocolate city. When I went there with President Carter in 1976, at that time Washington D.C. was 78 percent black. Now it's down about 42 percent black. Wow. Chocolate City is gone. 
Detroit, Michigan is going to be totally wiped out by immigrants pouring into the society. In 19, since 1970 up to now, we've had 45 million immigrants come into the United States. They came in over you, and they're displacing you. And then the second term they use besides gentrification to wipe you out is a thing they call privatization. You go into Detroit, Michigan, and as they gentrify, they're going to take all the public resources and things that should be owned by the public, they're going to place them through privatization to the hands of the wealthy whites. Whites are going to buy your golf courses, your subway systems, your bridges, your tunnels. They're going to, they're going to control your airports, your parks, your museums. Why? Again, because Anderson says, he who owns and controls the resources got the power. If you own and control nothing, you are totally, absolutely useless and expendable. And, so, and, what, and that's why we have, nothing has changed for us, because we don't understand the system of gentrification and privatization. The other thing they're using to wipe you out in those cities is called metropolitan forms of government. We're now going to do a regional form of government, which means that the whites in the suburbs can come into those black cities and set up some kind of consortium that control what goes on inside those cities so they can take the, extract the resources out of them. Another concept they use in those cities is called cool cities, which says cool cities mean bring in the gays and let them replace black folk. And so, and that, that's, the, that's the fourth scheme they use on you. And in Detroit, Michigan, using that as an example again, the governor there, has always set up a, a movement, a system where he wants to go, into, go to the President of the United States, Obama, and ask him for a green card system where he can start importing Chinese from China to make, make Detroit, Michigan the biggest Chinatown in the United States, even though that city had a 90% black population. They're going to bury blacks in Detroit, Michigan, underneath Asians coming into Detroit. And already in Detroit, Michigan, in Dearborn, right on the outskirts of Detroit, Arabs own 90 percent. 90 percent of all the businesses in the city of Detroit are owned by Arabs. Arabs and 90 percent black population must go to a 90, must go to the Arabs and get what they want in terms of food, medicine, clothing, because they own all. The, they own out of the gas station. You got 146 gas stations in Detroit, Michigan. Arabs now own 144 in a black city. Blacks own two gas stations out of 146. You own nothing. The rest, the hotels, are, are owned, and the 7-Elevens are owned by Indians. Asians are owning the, the, the laundries. The laundries. They're owning the hair and wig shops, the nail shops. Blacks own nothing in a 90% black city. And that's why now Detroit went into poverty. That's why it was declared bankrupt. Because blacks had money, they blacks had about a about 11 or 12 million billion dollar a year annual disposable uh, amount of money passing through their hands. They were going out to the suburbs, spending it in the suburbs, and spending it with the Arabs and the Asians, the Hispanics, and everybody else. And when I tried to put in a plan there for black folk, they said it was racist for me to try to help black folk. They said, "Yes, Dr. Anderson, we admit in this town that we have a we have an Asian town, a Chinatown, a pole town, a hockey town, a cork town." a Mexican town and a Greek town, but it's racist for you to try to do something for black folk, to build a black town. And guess what the black leadership said? They show he is right. <laughs> and if you want to find out if I'm telling a lie or not, you got black sitting right in this, in this auditorium that was there. You got right here on the front row, two here, you got Rosie Milligan that was there and spoke in Detroit. And I had over a thousand blacks come across America and say, we will move and relocate our business to Detroit to build a black community, a black business district. We'll move our businesses into Detroit, over a thousand of them. And guess what? The town got scared and fighting. And they, and they, and they sold up, told black folks, no, we don't, uh, it's racist to, to, for, for the plan is to come in and not include everybody and everything. And so that ended that effort. And so that's why Detroit failed. So what I'm saying to you is anything that's happened to black folk in this country is can continue to happen, but it is not by accident. Yo, good morning. Hope your day's a good one. I need to talk to y'all right quick. This stuff, like, really just... It really messes with me, man. Because, like... <laughs> what's happening, you know, all of this... People talking about racism and white supremacy and all this type of stuff. <sighs> like... 
you see you see what's behind me right now what's behind me right now is the hood all right it's the hood this the this this our community you know what i'm saying this is this is like the hood what's up sweetheart you all right nah i don't i don't have no change on me right now sweetheart. i don't have no money on me right now this is this is what it is this was this was going on right now man People are hurting, you know. I know people are hurting all over the world, man. But like right now, people are hurting right here. And so, <laughs> on the same exact street that we asking for money, and an old baby sound smell like she ain't had a shower this morning. You know what I mean? On this same exact street, same street. I mean, like you know what that mean right there, right? That's the dope spot. You see them little, uh, what they call them? Sneakers? That be hanging? There they go. You see them sneakers? You know what that means. You from the hood, you know what that means. Same street. I gotta show you this. Same street. Now, you see that? Now, these, <laughs> these folks ain't playing with y'all. It say, if you can't read it, it say 27 lots starting 600,000. 27. 27 lots, 600,000. Do the math on that. That's starting at. That's like 16 million. This white man over here about to do 16 million. Starting at 600. So that's not counting the ones that got the view that's going to go for 800,000. They can already do 20 million. 20. And let me just turn around so you can see what's going on. We across the street looking at this go up. Now that's that's the part that baffles me. We we across the street watching this go down. And it, and it can't be like that's like a that's one multiplex, that's two multiplexes, three multiplexes, four multiplexes. And these folks got the earth digging equipment. They got the cats out here. They not playing with y'all, man. They not playing with y'all. So to be on some, some foolishness right now as black folks, I ain't even pleading with y'all no more. I'm just showing you what this white man is doing. He's pushing you out of your own community, man. And we can't even, we can't even take, we can't even bathe or clean ourselves, man. We've allowed for these drugs and all this other stuff, our condition as a people to, to affect us to a point where directly across the street we can't even respond to an action like this. That's unbelievable to me, man. Like, I, I just, I cannot comprehend that. I know we got stuff going on in Puerto Rico. You know, they got relief efforts going on. I know we got stuff going on in Houston. But I'm talking about right here in our own community we got stuff going on. There's, there's a hurricane in our own community, man. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And ain't nobody doing nothing about this, man. This is unreal to me, man. It's just so unbelievable, man. So, I'm just asking y'all, man. You know, you got to do something, man. As if you're not, if you're not moving on this land ownership, man. In five years, there will be no black people in downtown Atlanta. It ain't gonna happen. They're not building this for you. So, one thing that I keep hearing over and over and over from a lot of brothers and sisters down here in Harlem is that Harlem is changing and they're really sad about the change that's happening. Every day they're saying that the culture of our community is being ate up due to gentrification. And the thing about gentrification is it's not like it's trying to come in and be a friend to the community that's already here. It's trying to push a community that's here out and this beautiful mural that we in front of here wonderful to see as these people keep coming in eventually that's going to change and we don't need to be erased just like they ran in charlottesville talking about they don't want to be replaced but we don't want to be replaced either or erased out of history but this is the thing we have to start looking more into buying land and starting our own communities so we can't be pushed out. Because as long as these people are in control, they will keep trying to push us out. I've talked to many brothers and sisters today, great people, entrepreneurial spirit, sweet people, but it's sad what's happening because I'm looking around Harlem right now and it doesn't look like the Harlem I used to see on TV. I'm seeing you know, a lot of 
people who was not black here right now. Just, just walking around like it's nothing. And it's fine if people coming to visit, but when they come to take over, that's an issue. And you know, my heart goes out to the residents of Harlem, the brothers and sisters that have been here for years. You know, you heard many people talk about how the change has just been so dramatic for them. But rest assured, we'll get it together. We have to. You know, shout out to the people in Harlem, people in New York. You know, I'll definitely rock with y'all. You know, you got a brother and friend in me as always. Uh, reach out to me anytime you, you need anything. But things got to change. Brothers and sisters in Harlem, you need to stand up fight for your community, try to take your community back and defend your positions that you already established here in Harlem. You see, we look at everything from a micro level instead of a macro level. So we think gentrification is about money, but gentrification ain't about money. With everything that they spend in to buy lots and build up in completely dilapidated spots, they could have built cities wherever they wanted to. So then the question becomes, why do it in black cities? Well, what happens with gentrification? In gentrification, they move in and they push the old people out. So where do the old people go once gentrification happens? What area is designated for the old residents who can no longer afford to live in this area for them to move into now? There is no area for them to move into. See, we gotta understand that the powers that be know that an uprising is on the horizon. So they gotta do whatever they can in order to stop that. So gentrification is used to disrupt any unity and harmony that we can have. So instead of us say where I'm from in Philly where gentrification is heavy, Instead of the 750,000 black people in this city all in one area, they sprinkle a little bit over here, sprinkle a little bit over there, sprinkle a little bit in this county, and now we're divided. Now we don't have no power. Now we can't even, for those of us who want to vote, we can't even vote anymore with any kind of power because we're sprinkled in different areas and they're the majority every single place that we turn around. So gentrification is not about developers making money. Gentrification is about taking black people, separating them, making sure they're no longer with their neighbors, the ones that they will fight with and fight for, and using that as a tool in order to keep us from uprising. So we have to be strategic about where we move. We can't be afraid of the word segregation because they use using gentrification to segregate us anyway. Now, of course, they're going to have a few tokens that live in the neighborhoods, but the majority of us are going to be forced out. So now we have to designate some areas where we are going to live so we can use that area as a base for us to build places where we own and control and dictate everything that pertains to us. But right now, no matter what, where we are, we're allowing folks to control where we are, and now we're allowing folks to come in and move us out and push us into other places where we're not going to have control. But if we're already getting pushed out of our neighborhoods, let's designate some places where we'll go and use that segregation as a power source for us to build for black people. And that's how we counter what they're doing with gentrification. You are intelligent enough to manipulate this system in your favor, and it all starts with your dollar. I love your it. dollar, your dollar could get you quicker to liberation than all the mentality and all the malice thoughts and all the thoughts of righteous anger. Your dollar could get you there quicker if you simply organized your dollar. There's enough dollars in this room to begin to buy this neighborhood, to fortify the west side, and if you're from Atlanta, you don't want it to become Kirkwood. Well, my grandmother owns a house that now taxes are trying to push her out of, but she gonna be okay. It's your grandmama gonna be okay. Cause her grandson sing a dance for a living. You get what I'm saying? <laughs> like I'm just simply saying, look at where we really at. I talked to Dick Gregory, me and T, I was on the phone with him. Dick cussed us out for an hour. Mm. <laughs> he we said, what can we do? Dick, he said, nigga, what can y'all do? <laughs> he said, you can't do nothing but keep making responsible decisions and try to educate other black people to do the same. We are only as strong as the ties that bind us, and we can't only be together in matters of church and political mm. rhetoric. Right on. So this tax season, I'm going to shut up. This tax season, what I'm going to challenge black people in Atlanta to do is to take your petty money, put it together, and buy a piece of land. Oh. Buy something. Right I, I 
I have a barbershop on Edgewood Avenue right now. I wish I could have bought the building because I'm a renter. I talked to a black man who owns a grocer's and we talked about gentrification. And he said, you know what? These niggas will never tell you, but it's our fault. Mm. And I said, gentrification is our fault? Hold on, don't hold on now. That's against the narrative, brother, <laughs> of what me and Banner be talking about. <laughs> that what he told me, Banner. He said, the children of the people that bought these buildings thought that they weren't good enough. The children of the people that used to own parts of this city that are sold out thought, I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer, I have a good job, I don't need to own my dad's side corner store. Mm. Now your dad's side corner store, now your dad's side corner store is worth a quarter million and a half a million, soon to be a million, and you're going to be driving by talking about what you wish you had. And I'm going to tell y'all, I'm not no nigga giving you no advice. I just bought a building in Savannah. Listen to what I'm telling you. Take the lessons you've learned here. If it's too late for Atlanta, what about Macon? What about Savannah? What about Chattanooga? What about Birmingham? How many people have opened up black bank accounts yet? Oh, I, I again say, see why we talking revolutionary? We don't take out the world, nigga. You ain't even got a bank. <laughs> you got a black bank that's been successful for 95 years in this city worth $400 million our goal should be a billion dollar bank that way they can buy the other banks and you have a real lender a real institution that cares about you so what all I'm saying is use your mind black people use your mind like my grandmother used to say boy use what God gave you God uh -huh. gave you more than fist and more than fighting and more than anger God gave you a beautiful mind, a righteous mind, and if you only bond together, you won't have to fight. You can be quiet on them. Mm. Oh, that's when it's bad. When you be quiet on them. Peace. This is Harlem educator, author, and activist, brother I.J. Taim, but we are on location in Harlem world, right on the very block where I grew up, 143rd. Anyway, um, we are here for black Un uh, Liberation University. We are here with my good brother, Harlem brother, brother Wayne Cook, who is uh, has an expertise in real estate. And this brother has a message for us, a brief message about why it's important for black people, African American people, to get involved with getting some of that property. Brother Wayne, what's good, man? I'm doing well, I'm doing well. I just want to try to introduce myself real quick. My name is Wayne Cook. I also have been in real estate for 14 years. I'm the principal broker of Fortitude SCS Inc. As you can see, uh, we're located in Harlem. Right now we have 318 West 118th Street. And I started my firm in 2015, last year. I worked for two top firms in real estate. Uh, Prudential Douglas Sullivan, I know as Douglas Sullivan and Halstead. So I got a lot of education from those people and experience. And I want to, again, the purpose of my uh, talks with Brother IG and Black Liberation is to bring you real estate information. And I would like to be able to inform you about how the importance of real estate and why you should set your mind set on investing or taking your money and put it into real estate and the importance of it. So one, we all know that we've been hearing in the papers a lot about gentrification and then we also been hearing about inflation or you know money being lost just being saved in your account and we also see how gentrification has changed areas that once was places that you have shopped or lived or even have family members that have gone on to meet see the our I was, you know, creator, but they had lived in that area of all their lives. And I want to talk to you why it's important to own real estate, because that owning real estate will eliminate gentrification. And gentrification for you that would like that don't have the meaning or understanding of what I'm saying is areas that have been affordable to low income housing for mostly African Americans or Latin Tinos or brown folks that lived in the area that was affordable and then uh, it became the prices of the same area rents have exceeded the income of that group and has caused that same person who worked for a company to dis move to a new location in order to 
live in an area that's safe and affordable. And then another group of individuals who can afford to pay more money or is willing to pay more money will cause the area to change in complexion and also in prices in terms of buying uh, food or, or even in terms of your rent. For example, gentrification at 147th Street between 143rd. There was businesses, if you look, if you show you on the camera, that once was all African American owned businesses. This area was full of African American owned establishments. And now, today, you have down the block an establishment called Papa John's. And you'll see there's no longer any more African American businesses because the rents are too high. So that's why I want you to understand inf inflation and gentrification go hand in hand, but in order for you to stop and counter is own real estate. So if you was thinking about buying real estate today, I would suggest you use the same tactics that has been used in areas like Brooklyn and Harlem. These areas of once were areas that were considered bad or considered um, this um, crime savvy and no one really wanted to live there. They, the people that lived there, they did not even want to own themselves. We need to start thinking of ownership for this purpose of the video. Ownership starts with thinking of how to what? Responsibilities of saving your money, a responsibility of getting in contact with a real estate broker, the responsibilities of maybe getting in contact with a financial advisor, or maybe get education about how to get involved in real estate transactions like assignment of contracts, or even think about getting into the career of real estate, which is simply a six weeks class, but you will learn so much information about how to get involved in real estate in so many different capacities. So, if you're thinking about gentrification and how it has hurt the communities of Harlem and Brooklyn today, maybe you should change that feeling and that emotion to how can I now start looking at areas that I can start building in to invest in just like how they're doing in Harlem. There are areas in Newark that we look at that's crimes heavy, but plenty of vacancies and I feel like if we have more educated owners that are willing to go into those areas to start buying now, when the area does change over, you'll start seeing that area will appreciate and grow and then you will grow your account and build up your wealth. Brother and Wayne. areas in upstate New York. Got a quick question for you, brother. So are you saying that certain issues that impact our people, you can't protest or demonstrate your way out of? You're saying this is an issue of not protesting the people, you're buying our stuff up, we don't like it, they have a right to buy it. You're saying that we need to start pooling our monies, get our education up on the real estate, and get some property ourselves. Is that is that accurate? That's pretty much accurate. What, what, basically what I'm saying is, you can't continue to say they should build this and they should build that. We should start saying, how can I build this? How can I build that? In the conversations when you see a potential idea, why you say questions like why is this still vacant or why is this still abandoned instead of why am i not thinking about purchasing this vacant property why am i not thinking about creating a business for this location stop putting it on they and start putting it on you okay brother just just real quick before we end what are some of the benefits if if african american black people were to start really getting their realty investment groups together and all this and we started owning property, what would be some of the good things we would see in our community? What we would see is unity and respect for us as a people. One, we have, we have to take in consideration whether you like it or not, that someone that has your same skin color represents you. Just like when you say you work for McDonald's and you put on a uniform, if that person that works in McDonald's is Ecuadorian and you're Jamaican, but when y'all put on that uniform, y'all are the same workers for McDonald's. So if someone does something wrong in McDonald's, y'all all get blamed in that uniform, just like you in the uniform in your skin. So when you bring, when you see those same people working together, you build unity and respect for that culture as a whole to their whole world.
The there third thing, the second thing what happens is you start to circulate your money more between each other, similar to what we call Black Wall Street in Tucson, Oklahoma, before the catastrophe and the great bombing. They circulated the dollar 36 times before it left that state. In communities within 10 to block radius, the dollar will only circulate one or two times. That's not good. So when you have more owners thinking of working together, they're able to do more business with each other, which keeps the money circulating. Then it helps that money will then go into building more families and continuing down the road generation after generation, giving you the opportunity for your son or daughter to get a job instead of going through the rejection after rejection because they don't speak the same language or look the same color as the jobs that are out there today. Yo, that's brother Wayne Cook. Brother's representing Harlem Strong. He, what he's saying to you, and I'm gonna reiterate, stop bitching and moaning and complaining, black people. Get your money up, get your weight up, step your game up, get your education right. Start buying this property. There's no problem we can't solve if we don't work together. And Once again, Brother thing. Wayne, how can they contact you, man? They could contact me, like I if said, they want a real cell estate phone, agent or yeah. Real estate agent. My email address is wcook at fortitude scs.com. That's the name Fortitude. And I want to iterate it. SCS is my kids' name, Shane, Christian, and Summer. This is a family-owned business, and I'm building the business for 100 years down the road so that they can have something to look forward to and build on. And I want to say, we love Jordans, and we love that symbol Nike, but what I love most about all of that Nike symbol, and they taught me something. Just do it. There it is. Wayne Cook, Black Liberation University. Peace. Hello, this is Deborah with Black Education TV. I was rather happy to find out that there's a black farmer who lives right up the road from us here, right down the road that way. Uh, we saw him a couple of times, and I remember thinking to myself, wow, it was a proud moment for me to see that some of our people do see the importance of owning land and farming. Because so many of us think that it is a, a wasted lifestyle and not something we should really get into. It's not that big a deal, not that important. But I'm starting to see more and more of our people buying land. Uh, there was um, someone on Facebook who posted a picture of their land and um, they were very happy to have the land and it made me happy to see that because we are waking up to um, the importance of owning land. I saw a video that said uh, ten, how 10 acres, I believe it was 10 acres, um, how a person is earning a million dollars a year on 10 acres. And I said to myself, I'm going to have to really research and get, into, get in to see what it is they are doing. I didn't get a chance to watch the whole video. I just saw the video title. And of course they were Gentiles. But they said how they make one million dollars using ten acres. And so I said, this is something we definitely need to research. Anyone who uh, sees this video family, I would suggest that you look up that particular video. It's on YouTube. But I was really happy, like I said, to see that there's a black farmer that's right up the road from us here handling his business. I saw he was on his um, tractor, and he had a big tractor too, big tractor, handling his business. And that was a proud moment for me to see our brother on his land handling his business. And it just makes us, makes you want to say more and more, family, that we should do what we can to secure our families better. You know, many of us go after superficial things, a house in the suburbs, big giant house on a fourth of an acre, or not even a fourth of an acre, just, you know, got a big house but no land. With land, you are able to 
do so many things, and we've been researching some of the things that you can do having the land, farming, growing food. I mean, we literally have an orchard of trees on this land, some that were already here and some that we've planted, and we're going to plant more. And we're seeking Abaya as to what to do with the rest of this land, whether we're going to do cattle or what. We're not sure at this point, but... um it is time for us family to start thinking on this level to make this happen because we're going to need to be producers of our own food real soon. Real soon. As you see over there in the distance, let me see if I can zoom in some. Our neighbors over there, they have, I would probably say more than a hundred heads of cattle on their land. One day, one of their... Um, baby calves got loose and jumped the fence and was over here on our land and I thought it was, you know, kind of interesting. It was a cute little um, cow. But um, it just got me to thinking that we as a people need to be more serious about things. I know we are saying our captivity is going to be up and in 2019 a lot of our people are saying that based on prophecies and whatnot. We don't know when anything is going to transpire. Okay? In the meantime, we still have children that need to eat. Families that need to eat. Our people who will need to eat. And we've got to get out of the lazy mindset of thinking that there's always going to be some store to go and get food from. We need to see more black farmers popping up. And we need to start growing food. I mean, don't just get the seeds, but grow the food, you see. Uh, we talked about that workforce thing, too. That, that's one of the big issues with our people, having a workforce of people who see this as something important to do. Not enough of us see this as an, an important endeavor for us, you see. Like I said, we always think there's going to be a box of this or a can of that to buy. Now, if that's all you can do right now, we understand that. We understand that. But we need to get ourselves together mentally and prepare our families for the future. There are so many things that I wish we could do, you know, in terms of unifying our people. But that's easier said than done. It really is. It's easier said than done. I wish there was some button you can push and make us act right, you, you know. Unfortunately, there is not a button you can push to make folk act right. All you can do is encourage, you see. Encourage our people and move ahead. You know, we're all looking forward to the fruit that we're growing. Back at the house and here, we want to establish a re really hardy farm. You know, um, not, not just growing food and raising livestock, but we also want to educate others on doing this too. Um, whether it's nearby or far away, we want to educate others on doing some of the things that we do. And um, others who have skill sets that know how to do things educating others. I mean, we've got to pass along our skills and our understanding and our knowledge of things because when things get rough, family, you know, I know right now we say, well, um, we have this mindset of if people don't get themselves together, that's on them. That's easier said than done. When you see someone suffering, then it's, it's a whole different ball of wax. When you actually see someone suffering and there's nothing you can do about it, you see? So, I'm thinking that we need to start encouraging each other to do what we know is right. There's nothing wrong with growing food and buying land. Nothing wrong at all. Nothing at all wrong with that. And I think that's the direction many of us should start heading in. I mean, even if you can only afford to buy an acre of land. That's something better than nothing. You see? You can grow a lot of food on an acre. You can raise a lot of, a lot of livestock in a place like this here and grow food. This is what we need to be 
focusing on family, especially if you have children or grandchildren. We really, really need to get our, our minds together and start doing what we know is right. I'm going to go ahead and head back now and say shalom. Enjoy the rest of your day.